This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Wrapping up the Habit series that we've been started here a couple weeks ago, and the title of my message will be called Creating Healthy Habits. But let's just go before the Lord that he prepares our hearts to receive. Heavenly Father, I thank you in advance for just... Uh, for the people that you brought here today. I believe that every person here is here by divine appointment. I believe, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has already begun to prepare their hearts and making it fertile ground to receive the teaching of your word here this morning. I, Father, I just pray that you would anoint my tongue to bring forth your word with clarity and understanding, a word that the adversary cannot withstand nor contradict, but a word that will have transforming power, that we can create healthy, godly habits that will bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Creating healthy habits. I want to just begin by just sharing that I've been a Christian for almost 40 years. And, in, and I know I don't look that old. I was probably about one when I got saved. But um, <laughs> people laugh at that. I don't understand. <laughs> but I, I've been a Christian for about 40 years. And, you know, uh, and uh, you, you just, I, I've never, I haven't arrived. I still make dumb mistakes. I still say things that are stupid sometimes. And, and, and I still sometimes will gravitate to old ways of life. And, 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 and it's, maybe it's, sometimes it's not conducive to what we would call a Christian. But, you know, one thing that I want to just encourage you about, because I know people get frustrated that I become a Christian, and, 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 man, I just keep missing it. It's so frustrating. I, I must be the worst Christian in the world. But let me just, I'm going to encourage you by saying this. Christians are born. Disciples are made. Okay? Christians are born, disciples are made. The new birth experience, when we invite Jesus Christ into our lives, that, that experience is instantaneous. We are born again. We are new creations in Christ. But the discipleship is a process, and there are no shortcuts. Our destiny, our destiny as believers is to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ that glorifies him. That's our destiny to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ that will glorify and honor his name. And there's a process to that. Destinies, our destiny comes from our character. Our destiny comes from our character. Our character is a sum of our habits. And our habits come from our deeds or repeated actions. And our actions spring from our thoughts. So the root foundation for ultimate change in our lives is our thought life. We have to change the way we think. We have to change our belief system. We have to get to the core of why I do what I do and begin to unpackage that and unpackage the lies we have embraced and replace it with the truth. Because it is the truth of God that sets us free. And so, Christians, I just want to encourage you today. If you feel like, man, I've just blown it so bad, I just, I just need to just give this all up. I, I'm just, I can't do it. You're right. You can't do it in your own strength. That's why we have the grace of Jesus Christ. It enables us to live a life that truth demands. Whatever God requires of us, he gives us the ability to accomplish it. That way he receives all the glory and doesn't have to share it with us. That should be liberating to you, but it's liberating to me knowing that I don't have to perform to earn God's favor. He loved me while I was yet a sinner and unlovable. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. So the root foundation for our ultimate change is our thought life. And I want to talk about how we can create these healthy habits. But before I do that, I'm going to, I, want to, I want to unpackage why it is so hard to establish these new habits that glorify God. We're going to answer that question in just a little bit. But if you have your Bibles, open with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and if you have uh, the Bible app on your phone or your iPad, you can follow along through your version and just access the password and just move right in, and then you can follow along with my notes as well. And I encourage you to do that. Um, here's, Here's what I do with that. I actually will take my notes, add my notes to it, and then I will email myself a hard copy. And then I created a folder on my, on my iPad with this, with, this in, with this folder of sermons. And so I can print out and review these sermons anytime I want. So that, that's a great, it's a great tool to go back. Believe it or not, I have sermons. I, I'm, 
Pastor Derek would tell you, I'm, a, I'm kind of a hoarder, but I have sermons dated all the way back to 1976 when I first got saved. I've got ring binders full of these things. I even have sermons I have yet to preach. Because I knew when God called me to preach when I was 18 years of age, I started to prepare. And, I, and it's funny, I go through some of these old, these old files I have at home, and I have sermon notes in there that I haven't even preached yet. It's to God. See, I don't create sermons just to preach them. I create sermons to speak to me, but also, in God's timing, use it as a tool to speak life into you at the, at the appointed time. And, and, and so, friends, we're called to be priests of, of the Word. And, and I just encourage you to, to take advantage of that app and that opportunity. Email that to you and then review these things. Just don't come and hear the Word and then leave, forget what you heard. Take notes and review these things and allow it to become a part of who you are. I don't know why I said that, not in my notes, but it sounded good anyway, right? <laughs> All right, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Looking at this particular passage, there are a couple things I want to point out. Number one, it says that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And do not be conformed to this world. I think those things kind of go together. We are to present our bodies a living, you catch it? A living sacrifice. It sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? A living sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that has to die. But we're called to be a living sacrifice. And you you see, friends, before we were saved, we used to use our bodies for sinful pleasure and selfish gratification. We were constantly feeding our selfish desires. And it's interesting that the word here, percent, is a verb that means to percent once and for all. It commands a definite commitment of our body to the Lord. In other words, we have to be intentional about denying ourselves and bringing our appetites into submission to the will of God and the purposes of God. That's what a living sacrifice is. So many times, you know, and this living sacrifice means that we are not to react and, and behave the way we used to, to ways that we're familiar Sometimes we medicate ourselves in, in ways, whether it be through drugs and alcohol or, or eating is, is another way. We may medicate ourselves. And he say, no, we, we have to die to those selfish appetites and bring that into submission and subjection to the will and purposes of God for your life. In other words, we have to die to those things that, that, that used to enslave us and ensnare us. And we have to die to those things and embrace what God has called us to be and to do. It's having the attitude... It's not my will, but God's will that is important. God, what will you have me do? And I need to lay my selfish ambitions and my selfish desires aside and embrace the promise of the cross and live, live and be what Christ has called me to be. In other words, I have to be intentional. I have to be aware of these things that are not pleasing to God, and I have to bring those under control. That's a living sacrifice. A lot of times when the heat is turned up, we get off the altar, don't we? Say, God, this doesn't feel good. I don't want to do this. I don't want to experience this. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. But a living sacrifice says, God, not my way, but your way. What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me be? So the, and it says, so we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't, do, don't respond and react the way that the world does. Because a living sacrifice, you, you are portraying hope to a hopeless generation. They can, they can see through your life as a living epistle to what a Christian is supposed to do and how a Christian is supposed to respond. But if you're, if you're like me, I blow it a lot of times. There are days I don't act like a Christian. Oh, your pastor isn't like one. There's no hope for me then, right? <laughs> Just ask my wife. There are times I say and do stupid things that hurt her. And I, and I come to realize that a lot of these things are from the wounds of my own past that drive my behavior to say and do things that are inappropriate. Because certain things will trigger a response. And I begin to act that way towards her. And she doesn't deserve that type of verbal abuse. True confessions of your pastor. But friends, we all struggle. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, you can just write that down, but Romans 7, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, the things that I know to do good, I don't do. 
But the things that are bad, that I do. Why? Because there's a battle going on inside of me. And I gravitate towards my old sinful behavior and sinful patterns in my life that cause me to do bad things. That's called reactive living. The second thing we see in this passage is called, it says, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Transformed by the renewing of our mind. The word transformed comes from the Greek word that we get the word metamorphosis. And metamorphosis describes a change from within. Now listen to this. The world wants to change your mind so it exerts pressure from the outside. But the Holy Spirit wants to change your mind by releasing power from within. And you become a reflection of the grace of God by yielding to the, to the work of the cross in your life, by becoming a living sacrifice. Think about this statement. If the world controls your thinking, you're, you are a conformer. Because we're called not to be conformed to the things of this world. But if the world controls your thinking, you are a conformer. But if God controls your thinking, you are a transformer. Because it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. And even though death is working in me, according to 1 Corinthians, life is working in you. Because people see there's a transforming power at work in your life that you are different. You do not respond to the things the way you used to respond. There's something different about you. That's because the transforming power of God is at work in me and is creating death in me, but life in you who witness the transforming power of God's grace. So let's go back to the question. Why is it so hard to establish new healthy habits and glorify God? Every New Year's, we all make these resolutions, don't we? And generally, these resolutions are, I'm going to change some bad habits in my life. I'm going to make some changes in my life that, I want, that, that are not healthy for me. But yet, it lasts, what, a day and a half, two days, maybe a month, if you've got strong willpower? But here, number one, here's the reason why it's so hard. I'm going to share with you four or five reasons. The first one is that we are born into this world with a propensity to sin. We're born into this world with a propensity to sin. In other words, we are born with original sin. We have a sin nature, that, and we are wired to rebel against God. Everything inside of me rebels against God. Even your cute little babies. I have the cutest granddaughter in the world. She's 12 weeks old. I know some of the other mothers will disagree with me on that, but I think she's the cutest little grandbaby. But she is so selfish. My daughter can be at work preparing, or preparing a meal or, or doing some work around the house for the other kids and her husband. And, and, but, when, but when my grandbaby cries, she wants attention now. She wants to be fed now. She doesn't care about the others. She wants to be fed now. She wants her diaper change now. It's all about me. There are adults like that. Yeah? <laughs> Go through McDonald's. Oh, that, they said this is fast food. I had to wait two minutes. Right? We say these things. And it's because we're wired to rebel. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3. There's none who seeks after God. You didn't wake up one day and say, Hey, today's a good day to give my life to the God. I'm going to become a Christian. No, unless the Holy Spirit is wooing you and drawing you and bringing conviction upon your heart and revealing to you a need for your Savior, you will not ever become a Christian. That's grace. He releases that into your heart and begins to woo you. And, and you begin to see yourself as empty and hurting and hungry, and you need something that the world is not meeting your need. You need to be filled with the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. That's a work of grace. Jesus says no one comes to the Father unless he is wooed by the Holy Spirit. Nobody. So we are, not, so we are wired to rebel against the things of God. That's how we're put together. And our childhood experiences will dictate how this brain is wired. All of our childhood experiences, everything that has ever happened in our life, do you know your, your brain is, is such a magnificent creation? The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, your, your brain records every sound, every experience, every sight, everything through your five physical senses. Your brain records that whether you will ever use it or not. That's amazing. But yet, sometimes you'll find yourself acting out in certain ways, and you don't know why you're acting out this way. 
It's because your brain has recorded an experience or an event in your mind, and you think the event that is occurring right now, is a, your brain can't tell the difference between the event that happened years ago. It doesn't have a timeline on experiences. It just records it. And it becomes a baseline of how you're going to respond to conflict and adversities in your life. And that starts as a child. Here's a statistic for you. Do you know that 95% of marital issues and conflict is due to unresolved issues dating back to the ages of 8 and 9? You carry that into your marriage. And if you don't believe me, just think about it for just a moment. You get into a conflict, and it's like two kids going at it, name-calling, blame-shifting, getting quiet, pouting. I'm taking my toys. I'm going to my room. That's how children behave. That's how children resolve conflict. And it's because it's engraved in your mind as a baseline. I have, I have worked, with, I have worked with, with sexual assault victims that have been uh, assaulted. And if they find themselves in an environment, I was with a friend of mine. And take, helping, helping, her, helping her take garbage out into an alley, and she freaked. I said, what's wrong? She goes, I can't go there. I said, but, but you, you own this building here, and you're, she goes, I can't go there. And, and it's, it's an event that happened, a sexual assault event that happened in her life at the age of 13. And every time she sees the surrounding environment, it reminds her, her brain says, it's the same, it's the same situation, same scenario, you're going to be assaulted. See, that's recorded in your brain. That's another reason why it's so hard to break these unhealthy habits because your brain creates patterns and definitions that you respond to. The children at at, uh, Columbine, they're now adults, but for the longest time, every time they smelled pizza, they would freak out because they were serving pizza in the lunchroom the day that the the, uh, shooters came in and shot shot up the students and the teachers. And they had to work through that. They had to give themselves reality check by saying that the experience that you're going through today is not the same experience that happened over here. Okay? So they had to give themselves reality checks. Secondly, our brain, rec- our brain matures very slowly. Traumatic or stressful events are recorded in our brain before we have the ability to use logic or reason. All these events, even before, even before the ability to process logic or reason, these things become baselines. Number three, our behavioral and emotional responses are based on our need to survive. We are all wired to survive. I spoke in Ozaki County here a few years ago. I had, I had 11 students from the ages of 14 to 17, young men, that, that the, the school system said that we can't do anything with these guys. Four of the boys were from Rawhide. They said, we can't do something with these guys. Would you, take, would you work with them? Would you try to help, to help make sense of some of their madness? For number one, none of these boys had a dad in their lives. Number two... There were very few mothers involved in their lives. Generally, it was grand, grandparents or caseworkers that were in their lives, but not parents. And yet, these guys had the ability to survive. Every one of these boys could have probably been Navy SEALs because they had a survival instinct that's hot-wired in their brain. So our behavior and emotional responses are based on our need to survive. That's how God has wired us. Number four... These responses are carved into our brain, and they emerge automatically when triggered. So when when something triggers, triggers us, we go into a routine response, and then it creates a reward. It's like, for example, people that are trying to cut the tobacco habit. If they're stressed or triggered, they grab for something. Why? Because that's what, that's what appeases them. It settles them down, so they'll grab for whatever will appease them. Maybe it's shopping. Maybe it's eating. Whatever. Something will trigger a response, and you will go into a continuous routine that creates a reward, some type of security in your life. And then number five, they become habits, and because they are familiar and comfortable, we continue to use them regardless of their impact on our lives. We continue to use them regardless of the impact it has on our lives. This is how unhealthy habits are created. We are wired for unhealthy habits. We are wired. So this is why creating new habits is difficult. Is that your brain literally must be rewired using a new belief system. And that's what we do in Trek. We basically help you unpackage the old lies you have been believing and replace that with the truth. So you can become the people that God created you to be. Because so for so long we have believed lies. 
And because we believe lies, we respond accordingly and we rep- and we replicate this, this belief system to everyone that we meet. Our children, our family, our friends. We replicate this. But let, here's the physiology. That because we have this, this belief system, we're hotwired to rebel. We're hotwired to rebel against the things of God. But when you become a believer, do you know there's a physiological change that occurs in your brain when you become a believer in Christ? There is a rewiring that runs parallel with the old belief system. And your brain is wiring around the old belief system because there's a new belief system that's intact. And the old belief system, believe it or not, the old uh, wiring or the, or the neural syntax that are wired, that will, that will actually reach up and devour the one that's running parallel to it and eat it. That's happening inside your brain. That's why there's so many stop, starts and stops in Christianity. And we, and, we, and we begin to think, I'm such a bad Christian. No, it, it, you just have to fight against that old lie that's in your life. Because remember, the new birth is instantaneous. Discipleship is a process. It's a growth that has to occur. And you're basically unpacking lies and replacing it with truth so you can walk in the truth of what God has called you to be. And it's, it's interesting is that this new wiring runs parallel to our old belief system, which is dominant, and that protective coating will eat or literally attack the new belief system, thus it, it creates a struggle that we call mind games. Mind games. And, you know, and, and the battle is in our, in our minds. Most of our battles, the struggles that we have as Christians, is in, our, is in our brains because we believe lies and we live our lives accordingly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, 2 Corinthians 2, 11, it says that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And it's interesting that word devices in the Greek means mind games. So if we are not ignorant of the mind games that the devil plays on us, we can be prepared to stand and resist it by becoming a living sacrifice and then transform it through the word of God. Here's the best way to remember this. The Greek word for mind games is nomada. Nomada. I think of it this way. Kind of my Italian accent. No matter what the devil says, I'm standing on the word. <laughs> no matter. I'm going to trust God no matter what the devil does to me. No matter what the devil says to me, I'm standing on the promises of God. So you'll remember that, right? That is mind games. And the devil plays mind games with us. He tells you that you're, that you're a loser, that you're a failure. You keep trying to be a Christian, but you keep, you keep gravitating back to the old ways. I saw you do that. I heard you say that. I saw how you treated her. You're not a Christian. You might as well give up. That's mind games. Christianity is instantaneous. But the discipleship is a process. And the process is growing up into Christ and being all that he died for me to be. That's discipleship. It's a process of bringing bringing these old lies into captivity. You know, science says it takes three years Three years to rewire the brain to where that will become the most dominant system in your life. That's why when you are a new believer, you can still gravitate to old sinful patterns and habits and behaviors, and it, and it doesn't really bother you that much. Just maybe a little quickening, a little check, check in your heart, and you feel kind of guilty. But after, after about three years of replacing that lies with the new belief system, now when you miss the mark, there's a conviction here, and you feel horrible. Because that's your new belief system. And that is saying that the, that the lie that's coming in and trying to replace that new belief system is fighting against it. And you feel bad and you begin to check that and it begins to attack that belief system. That's called conviction. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Do you think it's interesting or coincidental that Jesus walked with his disciples for three years? Why? Think about that. He walked with his disciples for three years. Why? Because he wanted to instill into them the truth and a new belief system. And there are many times they they still miss the mark along the way. But yet Jesus believed in them and he invested in them. I think we as Christians sometimes, especially as leaders in the church, we do a disservice because we don't walk with our new believers long enough. We get them saved and we put them through various programs and various Bible studies, but we don't do life with them. We have to do life, we who are spiritual. We have to do life with them and encourage them. The worst is we are to pick them up when they fall. 
That's not any of my notes, but it sounds good. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, it says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We see here that, that our battle is not against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle. And we are told that we need to pull down those strongholds, those things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. We need to be intentional about bringing those things captive. In the classical Greek, it's interesting that this word here where it says bring into captivity every thought or every argument that exalts itself against God, the word picture is of a Roman soldier with a, with a long spear taking captive their prisoners and marching them to a place of captivity which tells me that we have to be intentional about those habits that try to ensnare us, those habits that try to rob us of our freedom in Christ, those lies that the devil tries to use against you to make you feel this small, those lies. We have to be intentional. Says, no, that's what, the, that's, what the, that's what the devil says. That's what the world says. But my God says this. Yes, I'm, I'm not, I haven't arrived yet, but I'm, but I'm in the process of becoming the person that Jesus died for me to be. Even though I haven't got there yet, but I, I'm a... I'm, I'm a I'm a Christian under construction because he's still working on me. Amen. So we continue and bring those lies into captivity. We have to be forcible with ourselves and bring it into captivity and says, that's not the truth. That's a lie. I reject that thought. I, re I cast it down. I bring it into captivity. I'm intentional. And I encourage you to talk to yourself. We've got to spend less time listening to ourselves and more time talking to ourselves. We need to tell ourselves what the Word says about our situation and what God says about us and not what the devil's whispering in your ear about your situation. God transforms our minds through His Word. And we surrender our wills to God through disciplined prayer. To be a devoted follower of Jesus, we must develop a healthy prayer and devotional life. Amen? Amen. But that's hard. I've shared with people that I have failed miserably at trying to be, uh, to have family devotions. Confessions of a pastor. I tried to do it because that's what we were taught. Get your family around the, table, around the table and have family devotions. I failed miserably. Failed miserably at it. But I, began to, I, but I began to do what I was capable of doing. I could pray. I could, I could take life lessons and use them as teachable moments. Because kids, they only see what's in front of them, so that you take advantage of those teachable moments, whether you feel like it or not. That's, that, is, that is how you have devotions. You said, this is a teachable moment. This is how, let's bring God into the equation. This is what God looks like in this situation. And use that as, as your means. And that's how I did devotions. I was always in tune to teachable moments, so that I, because, I, because I knew my daughter was cognitive of that situation, and she would pay attention to what I had to instruct her. But if, if most, most kids are... Just they're all over the place, and and I was a sales guy traveling all the country, and I'd get something I wouldn't get home till late, so I would always pick up the phone and call and say I can pray for you. Let me talk to you. Let me share with you. What is there anything in your heart that I need to pray for you about? Well, I just got a test tomorrow. Let's just pray for that. You know, just things like that. So I was using the moments that were important to her and speaking to her life. But let me share with you some practical guidelines that will help you to develop a healthy prayer and devotional life. These are not rocket science. Number one, you have to make a conscious decision to do it. A conscious decision to do it. I am going to do it. I am going to make an appointment with myself to spend time with God. I do that every morning, first thing, after my shower. Grab my cup of coffee, pick up my Bible. I'm in my quiet place. And I spend an hour in prayer and meditation and reading of the Word. It's not a study. It's just a reading of the Word to hear the voice of God. And there's times where I'm just quiet and listening to that voice. So, but I have to be conscious. I have to purpose in my heart to have a daily time with God. I write it in my day timer. Even though it's something I do every day, I write it in my day timer at this time I'm spending with God. It's a non-negotiable. So make an appointment with yourself. Just, be, just uh, make a conscious decision to do it. Number two, take one day at a time. Take one day at a time. Don't get overwhelmed by thinking, I've got to do this for the rest of my life. That just, your mind just can't comprehend that. 
Just commit to doing it today. And if you miss today, then pick it up tomorrow. Just, you just need to begin. So take one day at a time. Number three, find the best time of day that works for you. Find the best time of the day that works for you. Make it compatible with your lifestyle. Consistency is the key. I'm a morning person. My wife is a night person. So her devotional time is at night before she goes to bed. Mine is first thing in the morning. Because I'm one of these guys that can't hardly stay awake past 10 o'clock. I'm, do- I'm, no- I'm dozing off at 9. Always been like that. Don't say his age. Always been like that. <laughs> I like getting up early. I, just, I love the solitude in the early morning. And, but find whatever works for you and, just, and do it that way. Make it compatible with your lifestyle and with how you are wired. Number four, do not set unrealistic goals. Don't start trying to pray and read for one hour each day when you haven't been able to do it for five minutes. Because setting that unrealistic goal, I'm going to do this for an hour each day, and, and then, you, then you feel condemned because you fell short. You've only done it for two minutes. Start with wherever you're at. If it's five minutes, praise God. Do it for five minutes. And then as you do it each day, it becomes a habit. And then you will, you will expand that time. Just organically. It'll just, it'll just expand when you get in the habit of doing that. So don't set unreal, unrealistic goals. Set, set attainable goals. Start where you're comfortable in doing it. And number five, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Don't put it off. You can even start today. Take a few minutes. The Packer game doesn't start until later tonight. So just take a few minutes this afternoon and just, and just get alone with God. And just do it. You know, most of us have smartphones, iPads, and there's a great app on there called of the Bible, and that's where YouVersion is. And YouVersion has a number of great devotional reading plans. So you have no excuse, because uh, instead of scrolling down Facebook to see how many likes you got on, on a quote that you did, go to YouVersion and read the devotion. And you can actually take notes on your YouVersion. Take notes on it. And, and, and then, again, you can email yourself a copy of those. But I use, I use what's called Life Journal. When I, was at, when I was at Praise Fellowship, that was one of the, one of the best things that I learned over there. Was, uh, and, uh, because, you know, when we, we say that we need to be washed with the Word, right? Well, if the washing of the Word, you need a little soap. And so, so soap is an acrostic. You want to write down S-O-A-P. Because when you do Life Journal, this is what happens. You read the reading plan, and it, this works for any reading plan, okay? You, you're, you're reading the Word, and then when a certain scripture leaps off the page at you, write that scripture down. That's the S, scripture. Write down, this, write down the scripture that, leap, that leaps out at you. And then read, the, then read that scripture again, and then, at, then, then the O is observation. Write what you see in that scripture. What am I seeing? What am I observing in that, in that text? What is leaping out? The A is application. Write how you, how you will be different today because of what you just read. In other words, it's, 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 how can I apply this to me? What I just read here, how can I apply that to me right now? And then P is prayer. Write out your prayer asking God to enable you to apply the truth you just learned. It's so simple. I do this, I do this every day. And I have, I have um, ring binders full of various sermons because the things that God gives me, I can expand them into sermons. But there are thoughts for me. Some of you are on my Facebook. I have a reflection thought every day. It comes from my readings that God has spoken to me and I share it to be a blessing to you. But these things, see, this, this is a personal thing for me. It's, a, it's, it's God communicating with me. I spend time in prayer and then I do this journaling. And this, and this becomes a habit with me. And because we have to be taught how to be self-feeders. Where sometimes if you just come to church on Sunday mornings to get fed, you're going you're gonna to be very and you're going to be very sick. You need to be self-feeders. And this, this life journal is a great technique to self-feed you because it gives you a discipline a, a disciplined, methodical way to read the to read the scriptures, but not just read it, but what is God speaking to you about today? And then what is in this scripture? And then how can I apply this? And then ask for God's grace and enabling power to help you to apply this, that, you can, that it can become a part of who you are. Amen? That's how we create 
healthy habits. There's no magical formula or a magic wand that I can wave. You have to be conscious of it. You've got to take one day at a time. Find the best time that works for you. Don't set unrealistic goals and just start to do it. Use good tools that you have. You have no excuse. I, I would bet before, you're, before most of you are home, you've already checked your Facebook post. If you had that same diligence and that same drive to read Scripture, how would your life be changed? And I'm not telling you to get out all, all the commentaries and try to do expositional studies. I'm just saying read the Scripture because it's a living word. And the living word will transform you. And this will help you create healthy habits and pray and ask God to help apply what you just read to change your life. It's so simple. We make things so difficult sometimes. But it is so simple to spend that quality, quiet time in the presence of God. And if it's just five minutes, you know, if you go to appointments, you know, whether it be a doctor's appointment or some type of an appointment, if you've got your phone, pull out the Bible app and read one of the reading plans. It only takes a couple minutes. If you're going to a doctor, you're going to wait 20 minutes, an hour anyway, so you could do a lot of studying. <laughs> Sorry if I offended any of my doctor friends that may be here. But anyway, this, this I really wanted to just encourage you to take the initiative. You have to be intentional about developing healthy habits. Amen? I want to pray with each and every one of you and just ask God to just resonate this within your heart so that you can be the people he's called you to be. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.